I don't remember it. All righty. Jeff Carrie Hammond here. I'm the immunization coordinator for Shalane Douglas um, Public Health. She's going to start off the presentations. Hello, thank you for having us again. Um, I'm going to start by talking about the 2016 immunization schedule, uh, the meningococcal B vaccine, which is new to the market in the U.S., um, what we've learned about flu vaccine effectiveness for this season's flu vaccine, and then also just wanted to recognize one of our local providers. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Sorry? Could use a little bit. I don't know how to. Winnie? Yes, I'm with the volume. The volume? Oh, okay. No. So Do I just. Like a mic or something? Is that the mic? Oh, yes, it should be. Yes. Is that better? Yeah. Oh, better? Okay. Yeah. You were glowing before. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I so um, every year the immunization schedule changes a little bit. The CDC tweaks it. That's better. Um, so this year is no exception. Um, I think that this year's schedule will be more user friendly. Um, they've changed the order of the vaccines, and so now they appear. They're grouped according to. Um, age of administration. So you'll see all of the vaccines groups. So you can clearly see these are the vaccines that are given to infants. These are vaccines given to teenagers, so on. So I hope it's more user friendly for providers. Um, they've also highlighted um, HIV vaccination for high risk children. In the past, the footnotes have been um, pretty limited, but they've really clearly defined who the high risk groups are and when they should be vaccinated. So this will be a really great resource for providers. Um, they've highlighted HPV vaccination for children at high risk. These are kids who are nine to 10 years of age who have been sexually abused or assaulted. So. And then they've added a new vaccine, the meningococcal B vaccine to the schedule. This is a newly licensed vaccine in the U.S. There are actually two of them, and I'll talk a little bit about them later. Um, and then they've um, added some footnotes for a few of the vaccines. Let's see. So um, technology is making our work easier. Uh, the CDC has a new app that you can use on your tablet or smartphone, and it has all of the um, immunization schedules for childhood, adolescent, and adults. So if you're out in the field, this is a really great resource. Um, and the laminated schedules will be available again. Um, last year, I think I tried to order one for all of you. I just got an email from DOH this morning, actually, and they are available to order. So I will place my orders probably tomorrow. So if you need more than one per school, let me know. Just send me an email and I can request more. But I really like these because they have the, the routine schedule. They have the footnotes on the back, which is great. I really refer to the footnotes a lot. And then they have the catch-up schedule. Let's see, right here for kids who are at least one month behind. And I use that as well. So when you call me and you have kids who are behind, this is what I look at, so. And then um, if you don't want to use the app and until you get the laminated schedules, you can always find them on the CDC website or the Immunization Action Coalition website. What is the app? What is it that you look under? <laughs> I think maybe. Is it for what? Or no, it is. It's the... It's the CDC schedule, and it takes you to, there's a link, so I don't know. let's see. It looks like you can download it from iTunes. I don't know on Android devices okay. if it's available. I don't know. Okay. Okay, let's see. Any questions about the schedule? I'm hoping it's more user-friendly. 
Um, so we actually have two new meningococcal B vaccines um, in the U.S. Um, Bexero, which is a two-dose vaccine, and a Trumenba. Um, Bexero was licensed in February 2015, Trumenba in October 2014, I think. Um, these are the only two vaccines against meningococcal B virus that we have in the U.S. Um, both are approved for use in people 10 to 25 years of age. Um, they targeted this age group because this is the demographics that's most at risk of um, meningococcal B disease. Um, right now, the vaccine is not routinely recommended. So it's only recommended for people who fall under certain high-risk categories. And I think I listed them right here. So people with asplenia, um, persistent complement component deficiencies, people who may be traveling like to certain areas of Africa where they have um, high number of cases of meningococcal B disease. Um, if we had local outbreaks here, then we could use this vaccine. Then they also gave a permissive recommendation to providers for kids 16 and older. So if a provider thinks that a, a child will be at higher risk of the disease, let's say they're going off to college, they could use this vaccine. But it's not routinely recommended. Um, um, so is there is is the meningococcal B disease uh, a certain small percentage of meningococcal disease that we see? Yeah, the, the reason it's not routinely recommended is because the burden of disease here in the U.S. is so low, it's not cost effective to add it to the routine schedule. I guess if epidemiology changed, it would be added to the routine schedule, but at this time it's... If it's not routine, will insurance still pay for it? Yes. Mm -hmm. The other vaccines that we do give routinely contain A, C, Y, W135. I think. <laughs> so there are a couple of vaccines that contain those serogroups groups that are given routinely at age 11 to 12 and then again a booster dose at 16. So we'll continue with routine vaccination of those vaccines. Just right now the B is um, only for high risk groups. Um, licensing these two vaccines. Um, was a result of two outbreaks that we had in 2013. Um, they had outbreaks at Princeton and UC Santa Barbara, and at the time, we didn't have a meningococcal B vaccine to use to control the outbreaks, which was a problem. So the colleges had to um, get permission from the CDC and the FDA to use an investigational vaccine, which they did. The vaccine was effective, it stopped the outbreak, and the government finally realized that we need to have a licensed vaccine here in the U.S. And so the FDA um, gave both of these vaccines an accelerated approval. So we now have them. Any questions about that vaccine? I don't know if um, the state will add any of that information, you know, to the letters you have to send to you know, I don't know if it's just going to be general information about meningococcal disease or if they'll specify there's vaccines for routine use and there's also vaccines given to high-risk kids. I don't, I don't know that yet. So, um, Moving on to flu. So um, the CDC has gathered enough um, data to report that this year's flu vaccine is about 59% effective, which means that if you got your flu vaccine this season, that you have almost 60% less chance of having to go to the doctor because of the flu. And that's pretty good. This is comparable to other seasons when um, we've had a good match between what's in the vaccine and what's circulating in our community. So 60% is pretty high. So we're happy with that. <coughs> Um, we know that this year's vaccine is 51% effective against the H1N1 component in the vaccine, 76% effective against all B viruses, a little bit higher effectiveness against just the um, Yamagata B virus in the vaccine, 
but we don't have enough data to determine how effective the vaccine is in the different age groups and how effective it is against the other A strain, which is the um, H3N2 component, and then the other B, which is a, from the Victoria lineage. So hopefully by the end of the flu season, we'll have data to tell us that. But um, basically, um, to sum it up, the vaccine is pretty effective. And so um, continue to promote the flu vaccine. Kids are still getting vaccinated. Providers are still ordering the vaccine, still administering it. I don't know if Steph and Jeff, you're gonna talk about surveillance at all, but flu Jeff, surveillance. Like, with Steph? I don't know. <laughs> oh no, there we go. Yeah. So. And I just did just want to say the health district, we do very little flu outreach just because we don't have the resources to do that anymore. But we still offer clinics, school based clinics for communities that don't have, you know, access to medical care or little or no access to medical care. So, you know, we do go to Manson, Arondo, we've gone to Inead in the past, Mansfield, we just can't serve every school, we can't serve every local business. We really want to focus our efforts on the outlying communities that don't have medical access, so. And then last, I do want to recognize one of our local providers, um, Confluence Health Pediatrics, was nationally recognized by Santa Fe Pasteur for their practices for meningococcal vaccination, their rates are really high. They've been doing a really good job of getting teens back into the office and that's a really hard group to reach. So they've really um, focused on improving their workflow, their work practices, um, and getting kids back into the office. So their meningococcal rates um, for the first dose is 93%. And for their second dose is 72%, and the goal is 80. So they're exceeding that that goal. They're doing a great job. So I just wanted to recognize them for their good work. And all of our providers are really working hard. It's it's just a hard group to reach, but they're getting better at HPV vaccination, um, getting better. They're really um, our Tdap coverage in our area is great. So they're um, getting better. For this, they just looked at meningococcal. Yeah, yeah. They recognized only four providers in the entire nation, so that's a pretty good um, recognition for our area. So, yeah, that's all I have. Do you have any questions? Oh, I do. I do. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Uh, next year, are you going to try? I'm just hoping that. You guys will be able to maybe at your clinic have a few days of open door vaccination for her. I did talk to my supervisor about this, and because we don't really have the staff to do that, I think we have to just refer kids to either their primary, if they have one, or Columbia Valley Community Health Express in East Wenatchee. I think it's on Eastmont. Um, we really only have one full time. Is there a difference between, will they give it on a walk in basis? At the East Wenatchee office, you do not. I've okay. talked to the, the nurses there. So if you send them there, yeah, you don't have to be established. They bill insurance directly. Um, it would just be a lot easier just because we don't have the staff to do that. So I wish we could, but. It's on um, Eastmont. It's on 9th and Eastmont. Yeah, 9th and Eastmont. Across from Merrill's. Yeah. yeah. And the wait time is pretty um, short. So if you send people there, I think they could get in and out. Yeah. Yeah. They did when I was there. No, they will not bring IFQ. They will not oh. give shots until he's established. Oh, shoot. With a healthcare provider. And I didn't have to do that. I, um, I just uh, asked the, the nursing manager about that again. If there was anything to reconsider that, because at least back to school time.
or maybe a certain day. Okay. There must be a misunderstanding because I gave my kids flu shots and we're confident we're not CBC. I can tell you I had a conversation yesterday. Oh. So. <laughs> So that's why I want to present the information about the sexual transmission infection and teen pregnancy. So it's still very challenging in the public health area. So it's a lot something to work on it. So, so because it's the still have a problem that's face us, especially in the younger age group, as CDC estimate about the STI new case, about 20 million every year, and half of them younger age in the 15 to 24, and account for about 16 million for healthcare costs. So this one, so I want to show the information from CDC website uh, is show that the younger age group between 15 and 24 age in Washington area, especially for the Camellia. You will see it's high in every county is the more than 10,000 10, red in every county in our area, and also gonorrhea is still, but it's not too high, but the main one is the chlamydia. And for the next slide is the information from the Washington State uh, Department of Health. You can see that at the uh, information for chlamydia, in, especially in Chilean, the rate is a 386 is higher than Washington State. And for the trend, the graph below is trend that keep going up, especially for the chlamydia. And this one in every age group. What's the difference between the cases and the rate? Cases and rate. Uh, case is the number. Case. Number actually ca uh, case, mm -hmm. and for the red, is, this one is per uh, 100,000, oh, 100,000 100, per, oh, yeah. Right. Case okay. is actual happen number of case. And this one for the top, as I said earlier, that it's happened to the younger age group in 15 to 24. For the upper part is the information from CDC that show the STI, especially in the group of chlamydia and 
Kono uh, at uh, 15 to 24, you see both could have a high percentage, especially in the comedian, almost 40% in the 15 to 24 age group. And the same as information in our area in the Shio and that class, you can see the information is the same. In 24, also high, and the highest in the 15 to 19. And especially the group that more affected in younger group is the woman, female group, very high. It's very unfortunate and every, a lot of health effect to female. And this plan, since I work for the Coalition for uh, Preventing Pregnancy, so this one I gather information from the lab report for the positive STI from our area, Chilean and that class from the lab report. So this one is total of the STI, positive STI that report to us. Last year we have about 450 cases uh, for the 2015 and for the 14 we have almost 500. It still keep down a little bit, but it's still a problem. So it's a 450 and then you can see the female, the number of female is still like a seven, almost 80 percent in the 14 and then 15 is 70 percent female. That's her case. And this one, so I want to know about the age under 19, 19 and under in our area. You can see that it's about 30% from the overall positive STI in our area. That's the, in the group between 50, uh, 19 and under. And for female, it's almost 90% female. That effect for the STI. You can see. So I just separate, see the group. Uh, every, every group, this one includes uh, STI or group, chlamydia, gonorrhea, because this one, the overall positive. So just those two? No, every group. Oh, what else is? Uh, gonorrhea, syphilis, HIV. Oh, HIV. Yes, every. Oh, Reportable. Can you help me? Sure. What was that? Reportable. Uh, report. 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 is the gonorrhea. Total STI. So, um, well, this is Suda's data, but what we capture, so we get um, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and HIV reports. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, there's, um, and then um, the there's another one, but we never see it. Herpes, but that's oh, really yeah, reportable herpes. with the first if it's the initial diagnosis. Whereas some of these cases, um, especially in the chlamydia, they, some, I have my frequent flyers that frequently come up with chlamydial infections. So some of those numbers are the same person diagnosed more than once too, which is an issue in itself, so. So this one, I just try to, uh, report check for, uh, for the 19 and under and then separate group in the teen group. So I found that the most of the STI under 19 is mostly is uh, 15 to 19. So in 14 we still have some but not many. It's higher in the group of 18 to 19. So it's about 60% in this age group but it's still high. And for this one, I try to cross match between STI and also pregnant together. So you can see the, from the uh, total 470, and then they also STI and pregnant only eight cases. And for the positive STI and also pregnant in under age 19 and under 
is three case in the 14 and 15. Going up, we have like a 12 case that also have a pregnant and also STI in uh, underage group. And this one, I try to check the race and ethnicity between non-Hispanic and Hispanics. For the 14, uh, then most of the case is the uh, non-Hispanics, three case, and for the 12 case in last year, uh, eight of them is the uh, Hispanic and non-Hispanic four case. But for the number overall of the STI is high number in the non-Hispanic group and is about 50, uh, 60% and then Hispanic about 40% in our area. And so this one, I, you may be familiar with the youth survey because for this one, so I want to show that the question that have you have sexual intercourse in the 12 case, even though in our area only Chilean answer that question for the Dakas, we skip it. And in this uh, number is only 50 participate, but for the state in about 100, uh, 1,000. So I think it still show something, show information that we still have higher rate, especially uh, higher than state for the answer. But I think we can cannot like, um, try to say it's about half sexual intercourse is about 23%. That's I can, it's not try to use our area, but it's very close number that we have. And the question that did you use the condom is still higher in 33%, even though, but the sum number is really small number, but for the state is 23%, that's I still have a problem. So that's maybe we need some education or something. So this one is from Department of Health, Washington State Department of Health, that summarized the problem that's why people did not seek the contraception. Especially for teen, you can see that the problem, not sure that's where to go, or afraid of parent is that the overall from the research that we found. So maybe this one, it's hard to say that education, maybe we need all the education for the parent to get involved in this case, so maybe we can improve the, the number of teens. Maybe it's better. And this one is the socioeconomic model for health, because it's, the, it's not only teen can uh, list of this by themselves or something is the social issue, I believe, because everyone, I think everyone not want to be the bad guy. Or, so we all love to be a good guy. So a lot of things get involved, like a teen in the indi individual or, okay, genetic or weak factor that you, they try to have a attitude or belief or risk behavior by themselves, but something influence them is like a family, peer, and everything, and also school or social interact with them. So a lot of things get involved is not the uh, teen. That's why right now we try to solve the problem by use the system and also use the envelope and community get involved to help solve the problem. So that's why we, and maybe for the policy, maybe we need the school more get involved or maybe like a comprehensive education to get involved. 
in to improve the STI and also decrease the risk of teen pregnancy. And this one is the one that I myself hope that maybe can help like a multi-purpose prevention technology by combine the uh, use maybe condom, combine everything together. It's like a simultaneous uh, work together in one shot, like a unintended pregnancy and also HIV and STI. But this one still on the try, but they try to keep uh, develop and still on going. And this one, if it, this one can develop and success, we can see for the woman here, STI maybe decrease pregnancy rate, complicate everything will decrease and also it of the first birth may be improved instead of we have a um, teen age, like a 14, because I still saw number 14 pregnant. So maybe we can increase in the age that proper for family goals. And even though for child health and we don't have to uh, add up for our health care costs, everything may be improve just for the information that's right now hopefully we can develop in this one and help improve especially for women health that we need most of the time women did not take care of themselves so we need to help and educate them to take care of themselves more that's all i have any question so the number of tribes, I have the sample of the MPT. So this one on the tribe. about varicella because the season right it's spring varicella's in the air um, and I just wanted to remind all you gals about these um, information sheets that we did last year this time last year on varicella we have them in English and Spanish um, I know I've dug these out and sent them to a couple folks that had called so um, if you don't know where yours are or you don't recall getting it or maybe you weren't here last year um, I can send these to Winnie electronically and then she could shoot it out to y'all. Does that sound good? So um, again, it talks about, you know, what to do as the school staff. Um, we touched a little bit on exclusions, which if that was something that we thought we needed to do with your unvaccinated folks, that's something Jackie and I would talk over with you. Um, so this is just some really good information, but I will get those back out to you. Like I said, it's I'm getting more and more calls. It is springtime and getting calls. Um, you know, a lot of times we like to have the doctor diagnose the chicken pox um, because, you know, sometimes it's not. Um, but that's not doesn't always happen. But, but that's one thing we're always going to ask you. Did they go to the doctor? Um, and it's helpful if you have the kid's name and date of birth because then we can look up their record to see what was actually said during their doctor appointment. So, all right. Thanks. Howdy doody. Very good. Got at least a third of you to say howdy doody. So I'm actually going to skip around a little bit. Watch. Got it? Oh, shoot. There you go, Jack. I know. I don't need my glasses. Okay. 
So I wanted to start with this actually because this is a little bit of a revelation to us as an embarrassing that we didn't even know this pro pro program existed in the health department and you guys need to know about this. So. <laughs> into any of these categories because it is a new program for us. Oh. So would this include mice? <laughs> Why not? Uh, Call Hillary. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. What's the mouse? Yes, there. Are there? Yeah. 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 Hmm. Goody. <laughs> I prefer to talk about hantavirus. I mean, we can come up with any diseases that du jour. It's a, I mean, are mice a serious problem in your schools? Yeah. Yeah. So what's the normal policy? Yeah. Then you'd have toxoplasmosis. No cats. You can have pregnant women with it. So what? What are they actually doing? What's their policy? What's their action plan for rodents? Let them run around and. So I know I, I know that the two existing, uh, and I sort of make fun saying we didn't know this existed. Um, Steph and I didn't know this existed. It, it hasn't been at the health district for a long time. The state used to do this, and then a couple of our employees got trained in the program, and they're actually going tra for a second training at the end of May. Um, so give Hillary a call. I honestly don't know about mice or what. Do you have any thoughts? No, so you didn't like my cat idea, so. <laughs> she has a cat. She could lend you her cat. We have to be very anonymous, right, Bobby? Because she knows. Yeah, there are that kind of But uh, serious, I mean, if you're, if you're having potential health issues, we can talk about you should not have mice in an educational department. And I'm serious. I mean, hantavirus would be the, the number one thing that people would go, oh, we can't have that. So if they're not taking it seriously, we're on your side. Please let us help, but only if you're in the Schlandelgas Health District. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, sorry. Probably not. How long have they been there this year? Would they have been involved in the remodels? I know that in talking to them, for example, they were involved in the Lincoln Elementary School remodel. Um, but I don't know about the other ones. So they currently have two complaints um, brought forth to them. One was in a, the Bridgeport School. And my understanding is that there was an adequate hand hygiene, that the, they're using porta potties, and the hand hygiene was. So they look, they're looking into that. I don't know the outcome at this point, but I know that's an active investigation. And then the Lincoln Elementary School is a remodel issue with dust and everything else associated with destruction before there is construction. So those are the two that I'm aware of, but um, it's good to know that this program exists because my first thought was I'll call the State Health Department and that's not necessarily the best in terms of what's going on here and what everybody knows, everybody else. So. They also did a mold investigation in Bridgeport. That's right, I'm sorry, I forgot the mold. Yeah. Mold. Do you have mice too? None that I know of. Oh, good. Maybe we need more. We're good there. You can have mold. We'll share mold with you. 
Um, so hello to many of you that I saw at Snow and those of you who weren't able to make, make it to Snow. Uh, someone reminded me, I know sometimes it seem a little bit off, but one of, one of our presentations, I actually talked about Zika virus at Snow. Um, and I like to talk about things that you might hear in the community because you're healthcare pr providers, right? That people might ask you questions about, but you don't necessarily work on at school. So I didn't bring Zika again, and I'm guessing based upon how many faces I didn't see at Snow, maybe I should have, but we can do that some other time. Or um, I'm happy to send out that PowerPoint if people just want to go over it. I did want to give you an update on Legionella because it is a community issue. Well, Steph and I have been working on this again, and we really thought we were done. So just as a quick overview, I'm not on a microphone, right? Good. As a quick overview, for those of you who don't know a lot about Legionella, I'm happy to talk for the next 12 hours because there's that much to tell you. So it's a natural, it's a bacteria that occurs in the natural aquatic environment and in soils. I can't stand that. Um, and then they actually go inside protozoa, like an amoeba. So this top right picture is actually, if you took an amoeba, slice it and look under our scanning electron microscope, or transmission electron microscope, all those little dots in there are individual bacteria. So these guys actually explode, which is what's happening here, with the individual bacteria coming out, and then they go into this aquatic environment, which contains biofilm. So the bacteria live within the biofilm, within the amoeba, and they're really, really well protected. So the normal level of chlorine won't kill them. So I can't turn them. You want me to do that? Oh. That's, that's a hose pit. Oh. Sorry. Oh, it's a trumpet. It's a continuous. The biofilm likes continuous water and moisture. They, they don't like to dry out at all. And what's the level of chlorine? There's a it's a huge level of chlorine to cut the biofilm. What so in you order to kill the, these bacteria, you need about four to twelve parts per million chlorine. Human health standards dictate chlorine has to be well below four, usually not above two parts per million. So we're not going to have enough chlorine in our system. So these biofilms keep growing. So there's currently outbreaks on cruise ships. You thought Noro was bad. Now you got Legionella and Noro. In Flint, Michigan, you probably heard you saw the lead. If they have a legionella outbreak and an E. coli outbreak in the lead, it should be all people. So there are many, many more legionella outbreaks that are occurring now. Ours just won't go away. Ours, <laughs> yeah. CDC has a brand new infographic sheet, and in this is going to go over all the signs and symptoms which we've been through before. But just to show you that this is available, unfortunately, they did not put it in. I don't know why, um, but looking at the common sources of infection, usually if you're going to see it in the shower system, it's going to be, we're going to be looking at large environments like a hotel, a motel, convention center, stuff like that. There are periodically individual cases around, like the average zero to one per year around here, but we don't do an outbreak investigation until there is two. So cooling towers, decorative fountains, and hot tubs are really good levels of places to find them. I know hot tubs. Everybody drones about hot tubs. Should we talk about pseudomonas? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, before I forget, if you're interested, it's actually a really, really good video, and you know I wouldn't steer you wrong. This is actually a CDC video right here, and it just goes through the basics, the background of Legionella, and it's something given to your kids, they'll be fascinated for at least 10 minutes. Okay. This is where our outbreak scans right now. We've now had a 10 patients. Um, we just got it in March. <laughs> expired. Now we thought it was over, we thought it was over. Um, so we've had two patients from Okanagan County, one from Douglas, and now seven from Chelan. 
they're not all in the city of Comanche, but they're from Florida County. So that helped us to try to narrow down exactly where all these people work together at one time, because Okanagan kind of goes to the cities. And so these people came in from Okanagan County for particular reasons. And so for each of these patients, uh, Stephanie would very, very carefully interview each one, and then we'd get together and discuss where these people had been. And then we were able to actually cross the floor like down to one city block for all kinds of people. Wow. But it wasn't Safeway ruled out? It was not Safeway? You guys keep trying to steal my thunder. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. And the reason that's significant is because you've changed the correct antibiotic, these people recover miraculously. If you don't, there's 5 to 30% mortality rate. You're already dealing with a high risk patient population who are susceptible to this. Mostly over 50 smokers or history of smoking, um, obviously other medical conditions. So this is kind of cool. This is what Compounds is using. It's just a urine antigen test. Drop the urine in there, and if it's positive, you get two two pink lines. That's why we're pink. <laughs> um, so anyway, this is something that's going out. It's going to go out to all schools as well, not the testing, obviously. But we're going to talk about what you should be recommending in terms of making sure you don't have Legionella, because honestly, we really, really, really don't want a Legionella outbreak in schools. Really. Really, and we would find out if it was the school. So we're gonna talk to you about some prevention. So before we get to Safeway, we're gonna get to the important part. Um, so we know that all ten of our patients currently smoke heavy or a history of heavy smoking. Uh, nine out of ten over age fifty. The, obviously the one person who wasn't was over thirty. Um, this patient received insulin in house, so borderline diabetic, obviously diabetic now. And the ninth patient, this patient was also intubated and sedated, so very severely ill, I mm -hmm. think. So when I'm saying that all 10 of our patients survived, those hospital providers did an amazing job. But some of the, one of our patients, what did the collapse in the sidewalk? <laughs> oh, yeah, he was walking. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, do you want me to demonstrate? Um, so one of our patients, um, they were able to walk to their place of employment. And so on the way to walking to his place of employment, he collapsed um, on the sidewalk. And luckily, it was in front of the Davida um, dialysis outfit. So someone was quick thinking, you know, they're medical folks over there. And they called the ambulance and scooped him up and took him to um, the hospital for assessment. But yeah, he was pretty sick. Um, and guess what? Male. Males. Didn't say he was sick. Didn't admit he was sick until he collapsed on the sidewalk. We don't like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and with, with the incubation period with this disease, um, we, we knew we were looking at a point in time event. Um, because we had these, we, you know, in clusters, we had our first set of patients, and then there was a lull, and then we had another set, and then we'd had our lull, and we were thought, oh my gosh, we're almost out of the wood, and then we just had another one. So, um, we, you know, there's these sporadic events that are occurring that's putting this bacteria out into the air. Um, so that it's, that's what makes it challenging, because you could test a water system and it's present one day, and then you can go back and test it, and you, it may not be present, or it's hiding in that biofilm. A lot of it really, um, with the testing, we learned a lot about testing and more than we ever wanted to know about Legionella. And so if you're not even correctly sampling, you may get a false negative result. So what's the length of time before you can officially say before the outbreak's over? Yes. Um, we already declared it over. <laughs> 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 you might know what you're saying. Normally for an outbreak, it's two incubation periods, so it's, it's, and the incubation period is usually two weeks. 
two to ten days. The CDC says during an outbreak, do it two to fourteen days, so twenty-eight days. But we just read two or more cases within a six-month period is what CDC considers to be an outbreak. So we're still within mm -hmm. six months. Yeah. Which is good and bad. What if we said it was really over and it wasn't, and then we get another case? It's like so. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, and again, just the second part of this is what we were talking about, you know, the exposure period, where do these people get it? So we were able to, through uh, Stephanie's stellar interviewing process, to determine that 10 out of 10, including our last patient, was actually within this block radius that I told you about. Um, and it helps to have these people from out of town coming in, because they don't remember where they were, what they did, when they did it. It's not like you were meeting like what day of the week is it, what, you know, did I have breakfast today? Um, seven out of 10 actually act, entered the grocery store. So our epi is better for the falsely accused grocery store that we're still getting to um, than for six out of 10 were on the healthcare campus. So, and then four out of 10 entered the healthcare facility building. So this proves that these individuals were exposed. So the, the punchline is we have a positive, a very strongly positive Legionella pneumophila serotype 1, which is what the test shows in a cooling tower at a healthcare facility. Okay, wow. So, I think I left it. Yeah, I think there's a toilet. <laughs> Next, please. So, finally the master heads. Yay. <laughs> Negative. Negative, oh. yeah. So Safeway, you know, went at me, and I showed you the data, so you understand why we went there. There's a history of Legionella outbreaks associated with misting heads at, so I'm serious, I have such a nerd, but those things go off in the grocery store, I step backwards. It's automatic. It's so stupid, but I step backwards. So if you're yeah. behind me at a grocery store, <laughs> <laughs> Like out. <laughs> <laughs> At least they warn you they have a little thunderclap ahead of time before it comes out. So these were all tested in the lab. There was one CDC elite lab, as we called in Washington State. We tested all these and we're like, what do you mean negative? Then we collect the water and negative. There's no possibility that it had occurred that you can actually get it by microaspiration. So we tested the ice in the soda machine that's there, negative. Legionella loves to grow in charcoal. It's like it's medium, but it loves. So one of the filters on this system was a filter, a charcoal filter. We tested that. <laughs> but then, <laughs> you have your cooling tower, and they don't all look like this. But if you go by, the other day I went by the fruit packing plants, and it's a cool morning, and you look up on the roof, and you'll see all this sort of smoke. It's actually water particles going off. Those are cooling towers. They look sort of like this, but they can be really small. They can be on the ground. They can be on the roof. Um, so they can be different, and they come in different sizes. But the principle really is that you have this environment. But it's leaching out lots of loves warm temperatures. So it really loves to grow between 85 and 108 degrees. And it can go dormant. It can go in a cyst state. Hyperchlorination. Paper saline, um, a lot of different issues and temperature. And actually, it's, it's just like, oh, I don't like it here, but I'm going to sleep. Great, huh? So there are very few things that can kill it, but this particular growth range, 85 to 108, is perfect for your cooling towers. I'm not a mechanical engineer, but as I as I understand it, basically they have this water level down here, and this is where we found it in the water and the biofilm. And the pump that makes it go like this. That's the best idea. The do. pump but that makes it go. It no, no. <laughs> it does this air, air, air thingy. It's magic. Yep. And then it goes through and it goes in the span and then it goes out. And the CDC says, look, it can go a mile. Cool. Right back to Some studies show that it can go two miles. So, but the, the Bronx. So last year in Bronx, New York, they had a huge Legionella outbreak, and they did find it a mile away. So it can seed, seed as in 
plant seed seed go into these other environments where it loves the warmth, water, stagnation, presence of organic matter, i.e. biofilms, and the absence of disinfectants. So that's what I mean, it's really a cool bacteria. And then if, like most of ours, it's on and off seasonally, the cooling power is only used during the summer, and it's not drained, it just sits there and goes into its cyst state, and then it forms up and you go So that's why normally you see more of it in the and when it's and when it's in that cyst state, um, even so, if you went to where it was hanging, it was in the winter, and it's hanging out down there in the sump. Even if you collected that and take it to the lab, it won't necessarily grow because it's asleep. So it may be present, but you won't find it because it's in that cyst. It's very yeah. sneaky, yeah. sneaky yeah, snake. So the other part of the story that makes it a little more complicated is we had a second oh, cooling good. tower. So the first one, remember, at the healthcare facility had 100% HNL and Namaco zero group one. But we don't have an isolate from the patient to match to the environmental isolate. But over 91% of human cases, again, these people are ending up in the hospital with pneumonia, over 91.5 of human cases are due to a Legionella pneumophila types. But there's also Legionella lombichi, there's Legionella dadii, there's Legionella ansii, you're getting the picture. Feely I'm like, feely I, F-E-E-L-I-I. Who would name a bug feely I? Touchy feely.
super, super dense. If I recall, 50 to 100 parts per million of chlorine, you think of um, or really, really high temperatures, which, did I mention it can survive freezing? Oh. How high a temperature is really high? 158, four, um, but they say <laughs> boiling will kill it for a few minutes. So that's why really for these things, we're really looking at chlorine. There are uh, some other chemicals like bromine will, but the city of Wenatchee has said bromine isn't good because it could potentially cause it's a potential carcinogen, so it's not approved here. They're looking at it now, probably. But so really, we're we're they're dealing with chlorine now. So we're in the monitoring phase because unfortunately, it's very common for it to come back to the same place. They use the chlorine to get rid of it out of that cooling tower. I mean, to do that. That's already happened already, isn't it? Being being done, being currently and being monitored because. Yeah, don't forget the biofilm. Sometimes it will, you know, be be in these pipes, and then it'll be like dislodged through road construction. <laughs> Vibration. And East Wenatchee, Collingwell mm -hmm. Parkway. They've totally taken off all of the paving. I bet we're gonna have a Legionella outbreak in the health district. We'll be right on. <laughs> <laughs> there will be no one to to help you. Well, I have the age problem, but I don't smoke, so it should be okay. It's for me, okay. She's younger than 50. Okay, she has a family. So one final thing, and I know, Winnie, we're, we're running a little late, and I did send this to Winnie. Um, so there was some questions at the snow meeting about some of the issues that the Schlein Douglas Health District deals with. And so I asked Carol McCormick to put together basically a list of some of the projects associated with maternal and child health and what's called a 1422 grant. And I'm not on this grant, but I call it the wellness grant. Um, and Winnie can tell you a little bit more about the, the projects that she's involved in too. But I just wanted you to be aware there are a lot of things going on that we don't tell you about. So this is nutrition, one of the things Suda's working on. Um, sit there wisely, you don't have to say anything. <laughs> is uh, basically looking at vending machines to see whether or not they're really salty products, high sugar level, where they are within the machine, know how it could be healthier snacks could be made available um, this is a CDC sponsored program all the MCH things that we normally do with WIC etc and then the 1422 grant changed and the reason is it's the same stuff but they changed the grant name I don't know why they do that but um, that, that's the feds for you um, so healthy living uh, working with Wenatchee Valley healthy living um, farmers market uh, grocery stores for better signage, a complete streets program, which is kind of cool, um, a walking assessment of several parts of Wenatchee, and then the WIN 211, which I do not know anything about. It's a website that you can go to and search um, for different um, uh, classes or um, providers that are in this area. So if you need cool. to have a you wanted to um, know in your area if there's a diabetic educator or there's diabetic classes, you could just go on there and it should have it there. So they're trying to um, enhance that uh, website to make it more comprehensive and um, get everyone's information. Thank you. A lot of services. Yes, a lot of services. And Kathy, did you want to talk about that project at Eastmont? I don't know. I just wanted to know if you wanted to talk about it. <laughs> find it before then I'll tell you but anyway <laughs> uh, diabetes um, basically a comprehensive survey of diabetes in the area and then uh, mobilizing active transportation teams in Wenatchee and East Wenatchee so a lot going on anyway so you have it electronically or Winnie's going to be sending that out to you it's just nice to know some of the other projects that are going on it's not all Legionella but we don't care about any of these because it's not Legionella any questions <laughs> I have a question oh besides what it is I'm working on oh let me you want to look for East sure. Wenatchee in here East Mont well, School yeah it actually says East Mont oh like at the end of the yeah is it firmly established that women Acquires a Zika virus, and is it 
completely gone after a certain period of time. It's not like age that you, know, you have it forever and then if you get pregnant three years from now, it could still be in there and affect your fetus. Okay, I'm going to go for that at three points. So the one is they believe that it's only within the blood for zero to seven days. That's going to be zero. Yeah, it can't be I know. You can't see the blood. Well, anyways, that's what they say. <laughs> Up to seven days. Um, there's some debate in, in the European Union. They're saying up to 12 days, but short period of time, about two weeks. Um, and that there's no evidence, no current evidence that will affect any future pregnancies. And the third, and probably the most important, is that the data that just came out showed that the women who were delivering or aborting um, children, fetus with microcephaly, uh, were affected very much. Like parvo, yeah. kind of like the parvovirus during that type of um, and, and toxoplasmosis and German measles and um, CMB. CMB, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah very good. So it, it's not the only one. About 250,000 children each year are affected with microcephaly in the United States. I think it's just adding on to the pile. So they truly believe at this point that it's, if the woman is infected with the virus during the first trimester, she has a greater chance of having a child with microcephaly. That's the latest. So, and if you go to an area that's 2,000 meters or above, you're going to be okay because there's no mosquitoes. <laughs> Plan your vacation to support you. It's a Teen Pregnancy Prevention Coalition with representation from Eastmont High School, Confluence Health, the ESD, Catholic Family and Child Services, CBCH, um, and they're going to invite Planned Parenthood. Ring any bells? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am part of the Tuna is part of the um, Teen Pregnancy Prevention Coalition, which is the Eastmont High School Teen Pregnancy Prevention Coalition, which is a group of healthcare providers and when he's there sometimes um but he's a person I don't know it's just a group of people who are from uh, there are three I think people from the health department from confluence health from the hospital from um oh a couple of the uh, life choice yeah the, the yeah, life choice there. Yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. um just so anyway, I inserted myself into the organization when I heard they were having oh, something yeah, because please. I thought that it was important for a school nurse to be there and uh, have some representation. At one point, I thought it would be really, really helpful to um, uh, do my own survey to try and figure out what the sort of trying to assess the perspectives that high school teens, you know, high school teens have regarding pregnancy. Like, you know, would you be horrified? And I, so I, I made a questionnaire and I passed it out at our health fair to all of the students who came in the high school. Cool. And it had about six questions for both girls and guys. Would you be horrified? Or would you be a little excited? Or would you be really excited uh, would about, you, know? you know, finding out you're pregnant or finding out that your girlfriend is pregnant? And um, I just thought that would be really helpful. And I got, a, I got about... 250 respondents. Wow. Good back. job. Pretty good. And then I realized that I'm not a statistician. It's hard to determine any kind of information from that. I should have used Susan because she's more that way. But you still anyway, can. It is hard to really draw conclusions from things like that, but it did help me get a better idea. I think from what I learned from that particular survey was that I think most teens in this area know uh, <laughs> know how they can prevent pregnancy. They just have that feeling, you know, that's probably not gonna happen or just you know, withdraw in time or you know, there's just a lot of other issues yes. and while most of them said they would be at least moderately horrified, <laughs> there is still a small percentage of, of teens, girls and guys. There were more guys who said that would be really exciting. So you know, in my mind, I think there were more of those percentage-wise than there are actual teen pregnancies in our valley. So that tells me that I don't know of anything we can do 
really is going to lower that rate because if there are just a certain number of young women who embrace the idea, it's going to be really challenging. So anyway, we're still working and hopefully we'll come up with some really good um, plans for how we can respond to this. And they're going to be spreading out uh, questionnaires to all the local practices who deal with pregnancy and STI um, evaluations to try and get an idea of the use of birth control and that sort of thing. So, I don't know if I'd use the term spreading with STIs, but <laughs> it's your choice. Okay. <laughs> Politically correct. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Thank you. I just had one. How, when the, you get a testing, what's the time frame when the test is sent off? Because I know you said last weekend that there two tests out in Okanagan County, and then I didn't and they in that day. Oh, good. Um, so, and the answer is two to 12 weeks. Oh. So CDC is actually, the FDA just approved uh, an emergency authorization for this one test, the pressure test for Zika, Dengue, and you remember chicken for the disease. But it's a PCR test, it's got to be early. And uh, hopefully that is chicken to come. So far, I don't want any. So based on your, what we do know about women and pregnancies, would you recommend a pregnant woman going to like hunters at all? I have a niece who's all kinds of pressure. She'll be at the end of her second semester. I don't think we know enough to be able to say no. But the current evidence so think of neurologic development why would you just give it to me? I would just give it to me. 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 I Shelly is going to come, um, Shelly Selser, who works here at the ESD, she just got handed over the um, Migrant Education Health Program. Um, Mike Taylor uh, retired, if you can believe that. Oh, wow. And so they said, hey, we need someone to work on this. And so she's been doing it for a few months, so she's just going to give us an update. Okay, and then um, I just have a few other announcements after that, and then we can get out of here. Okay. Okay, thanks. Do you mind if I just put it up there now? Yes, of course. That so, might be easier. So before we lose everybody. <laughs> well, I'm going to feel like a VIP now. <laughs> I wanted to show you guys a website. Where is that? Before we lose everybody. Have you guys ever seen this website? It's going to catch people who teach this. It's fantastic. No. <laughs> 
It's for sexual health and birth control and everything else. It's brand new. It's totally under the parameters for uh, came out on the OSPI approved list for what? What's the word they use? Factual, whatever. I remember their phrase. Yeah, right. But it's so accurate. Yeah. Yeah. And I just thought it is so awesome. And just bedsider.org. <laughs> Bed cider, yeah. It's easy to remember because of that. And it's in Spanish, too. And it has little videos. It has, um, like, watch this, birth control methods. You can compare them. You can see what they recommend, see what's highlighted. You can see what they look like. You can touch it. Everything highlight looks, says what it does. Um, look at this most effective. Um, party ready. <laughs> I know, right? STI prevention, hormone free. Uh, I mean, what I lo I loved it. Like that internal condom for a woman, but everybody gets to see what it looks like when you don't have the actual product. The students really respond. And then you look, you go compare, and it gives you a graph, and it's all side by side. It's just, and it's highlight. You just touch it. Like here's the IUD. How effective is it? And then side effects are, they just pop right up. It's awesome. And here's your um, irregular bleeding, blah, blah, blah. I don't know how much sexual ed you guys do, but I do a lot of it. I don't. A lot of sexual health. Well, I'm mostly elementary. That's well, and I teach it too, so then I get more and more questions. But I mean, I don't have to know it because this has been the most user friendly site I've ever had. And then you don't have to worry about asking those stupid questions. Right. And that's why I said, you know, for whoever doesn't want to come talk to me, but every time I teach a class, somebody comes talk to me about. Oh, our condom broke, or I think I might have an STI, or where do I get condoms? Where do you know? There's something all the time. So this one is not right now. That means abstinence. How do you compare? You know, how easy is it to get? Pretty good. That's funny. Cost. Wait, what is that one? Not right now. I thought it was the abstinence one. Yeah, it is. I'm surprised they didn't put pretty good health benefits. Why didn't they say excellent? That's weird. Yeah, that's kind of funny. Emergency contraception, it's all about that. And then they go build your own. So if somebody doesn't know what they want to do. So like my daughter's going to college and this is what we're going to do today. We're going to put all this stuff side by side and I'm going to show her how to do this. And there's all the features and then there's real stories. And it's all up to date and they're not tacky. They're really all different ages on every topic. Like from abstinence. Yep. And they're from like 20. They don't have like 15 stuff on there which I also was like, oh, that's cool. So, and then you go through every single one of them, like the patch, or, or I loved, I listened to the abstinence ones too, and it was so cool because they used examples of people who had been abstinent for religious reasons, and she didn't look like an idiot, which was so nice for a change. She's you know, not in the habit. Yeah. yeah, and then the other one was somebody who'd had sex but had become abstinent now, which is what I tried to teach kids all the time. Abstinence is is not a lifetime thing, but it can be an intermittent thing, or it may be because your first experience with sex wasn't what you expected, you can be abstinent again. And their faces look so relieved when I teach them that. It's like they think, in a small school, once you have sex, they think they have to have sex with the next person, and the guys expect it. If you take, I did a survey, 80% of them assumed that they get to have sex because she had sex with someone else. It's appalling. Have you seen the? Um, There's the pill. Thing on Where's the? Yeah, abstinence. On Facebook about what consent is done by the British. No, I'd love to see that. Is it hilarious or is it accurate? It's hilarious because it says there's no talk about sex. It's like having tea. Somebody can say, "Would you like some tea?" They say, "Yes, I'd like some tea." But now you make the tea, you boil the water, you steep the tea. Oh, I love.
Right, and the person's unconscious. <laughs> Don't give them tea. Oh, that's perfect. I have to, I'm going to play that one I teach tomorrow. What's and it? we're doing healthy dating and relationships. Um, <laughs> the British consent. consent. Yeah, yeah. Is it under YouTube? Somebody shared it on Facebook. Oh, I've got to watch that one. Absolutely. That's perfect. And this is all emergency contraception. Anyway, I love this site. I was so excited because I've been teaching for five years. This would have saved me some really uncomfortable moments. Um, and it's cool. And it's private. And it's you can even put on here, you know how kids are so tech savvy. Look, birth control reminders. They can put it right onto their stuff. Appointment reminders. You can get a text to yourself to remember to take your pill. I think it's fantastic because I have like a really airheaded niece. <laughs> and she actually has her boyfriend remind her to take the pill. I don't know. Some people just need that kind of stuff. So I was like, I think this covered everything that I've ever... And look at this. You text my BC to this and then it... It sends you the link you want for your birth control reminder. Kids will kids will date this when you're in college or life's busy. I think people will really get into this. You know. And then this doesn't work for our area. I tried it, but there's health centers nationwide, and you put it in the zip code and junk like that. And, and, and it, it's it's not active for Wenatchee. I tried that, but there's even emergency contraception, where to get it. Um, that part didn't seem to be as well developed, but everything else was great. And I love fact or fiction because there's so many myths out there. And there's, these are great. Is there any volume on these? I wanted you guys to... I was hoping the nurses would see this, but hopefully. Yeah, it's awesome. Watch, this is awesome. I wonder, is there volume? Yeah. This is all the stuff you do to be sexy. See, it's so current. Of course, it might first. <laughs> it puts it in perspective. I love. You know, I mean, just quick and effective and funny and and not tacky. Just you know, the good, the bad, and the barren blanks. You know. Who this is? This is the UK explains sexual consent in the most British way ever, with tea. <laughs> oh, wait, I gotta press this. <laughs> as simple as tea. Instead of initiating sex, you're making them a cup of tea. You say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they go, oh my god, I would love a cup of tea, thank you. You did this really well. Then you know they want a cup of tea. If you say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure then you can make them a cup of tea, or not, but be aware that they might not drink it. Man. And if they don't drink it, then, and this is the important bit, don't, don't make, make them, them drink, drink it. it. This is perfect. Just because you made it doesn't mean you're entitled to watch them drink it. And if they say, no thank you, then don't make them tea at all. Just don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea. Don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea. They just don't want tea, okay? They might say, so awesome. yes please, that's kind of you. Yeah. And then when the tea arrives, they actually don't want the tea at all. Sure, that's yeah. kind of annoying, as you've gone to all the effort of making the tea. It is but they remain annoying. under no obligation yeah. to drink the tea. Yeah. They did want tea, now they don't. Some people change their mind in the time it takes to boil the kettle, brew the tea and add the milk. And it's okay for people to change their mind. And you are still not entitled to watch them drink it. And if they're unconscious, don't make them tea. Unconscious people don't want tea. And they can't answer the question. It's not the whole thing. No, it's because they're yeah. unconscious. Thank so, you. I'm going to use that one. Yeah. So it is, what is it? It's called under, in, it says insider added it. I don't know. I wanted to do the more video. Where's the one? Anyway, about? I think it's it's hilarious. And oh, that's terrific. And I think it, you know, you're not talking. You don't say, 
Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. Oh, we're we're trying to fans a bit. You could, we're just talking about tea. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. I love that one. Thank you. Not mine. We did it. Oh, what was I there? Oh, you're talking about using mental health per se. Yeah, that's mental health. Okay. Okay. We have a suicide Sorry. Oh, this is the one I like. So, uh, this is great. When you were talking about <laughs> I found out that one didn't count. Oh my God. Sorry. That's what I'm leading because I own it. Well, I schedule out like oh, they had to before this was set. No, okay. okay. Oh, 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 no, yeah. oh, I can tell she's going to make it. Don't take a while. It's okay. Yeah, it's awesome. It was a little bit. I know. I know. Have you been saying the truth? Yeah. It's good for us. It is. Yeah. It is. Well, Jack said it's a little bit. But now, let's get it. Yeah, that's what they're saying. We don't say that. I think they know that. I think they know that. Yeah, of course. Oh, I will. Mentioned to you. Right. Yeah. 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 But I saw this funny no, I do Okay, let's go ahead and wrap up so we can be done. Let it it's hard to control these ladies. Yeah, no kidding. She's like hurting cats. Yes. Okay, you brought a few too because yeah. I'm low on these. Okay, let's give some of Kelly Selsenar ladies attention here. We'll get we'll get going so we can get on the road. Honestly. Yeah, I'm going to Now, where did everybody go? I walked in the room and I'm like, oh, that, hey, my poster is still there for my youth mental health first aid class. I was wondering what we were doing a few weeks ago. I'm going to try to find out. I don't have probably enough for every single person, but that's probably okay. There's a bunch up there. You can read them. Okay, I'll, I'll break those out. Yeah, you bet. And I'll tell you what it is here in a sec. There's a few more here, though, she says. Mm-hmm. Yep. Are these the ones? That, yeah, these are in English. Okay, you get one. I'm just going to try. Okay. I am shut. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Shelly Sessler. I work at North Central ESD. I've met a good number of you over the years. Nice to see you again. Um, today, I'm talking to you in my role, my new role, that is very interim role. 
um, as Migrant Health Program Supervisor for the State of Washington, which sounds really big um, when you say it out loud like that. Um, anyway, it's interim. Did I mention it's interim? <laughs> But there's a contractual agreement or a contractual statement that I will uh, collaborate. Always oh, ever about it. Yeah. So I did get an opportunity to talk to Wendy colleagues of the statewide um, school nursing board director group, and, and then Wendy invited me to talk to you guys just very briefly today. Um, I am new in this role and interim, as I mentioned, and so you know my awareness of exactly what my great health program is is. It's developing. It's getting better by the day. Um, but uh, but I do want to make sure and call out for you. I don't think the two programs have really worked too closely together um, over the years, and I could be wrong about that. But um, migrant health program is out there to serve all the migrant students in the nation. Federal program. Um, we have a lot of migrant students, as you probably are quite aware. Um, migrant students are any, any student in a family who has moved due to agricultural or fishing um, industry reasons in the last 180 day school year. So it could even go two years because you know if they moved in the last 180 day school year, they're still migrant until the end of the next one. Um, so that covers a lot of kids. Often they stay migrant because their family is consistently moving at least once during the that year for work due to agricultural or fishing reasons. Sometimes migrant students are fairly stable, but they do have this once a year or twice a year um, happening where family members do move for agricultural work. So it can be kind of hard to decide who's migrant who's not. That's why there are people in every district who are trained to do that, and they maintain a list. Um, when kids enroll, or they re-enroll, they come back to a district, they're asked questions that are supposed to teach out, are you migrant? So every one of the school districts you work in um, does maintain a list of which students are considered migrant at this current time. Um, kids who are migrant then qualify for certain services. Um, and I'm sure you've heard of migrant educational services or bilingual educational services, which often go hand in hand, but aren't always the same thing. And there is sometimes confusion about that. I'm not here to talk to you about that. I'm here to talk to you about the other part, which is Migrant Health Program. So there's Migrant Ed and Migrant Health. They're parts of the same funding stream, but the two programs are pretty separate. Um, migrant Health is intended to make, the, the goal is to make sure that migrant students get good health care. And you can imagine as they're moving a lot, um, they don't often have a good medical home, perhaps or physicals on a regular basis, or contact with a regular um, physician or um, nurse practitioner or any, anybody like that. So they may or they may not. And they may have had changes in location where they did have a medical home for a while and now they're kind of there. They don't know where to access services. Um, and they may come, as you know, with medical issues that need to be addressed, but access can be a problem for them especially moving into new communities. So the migrant program recognized that decades ago, and this funding was put into place to try to assist them. So the first step is identification. That's done by someone in each district, and that's required by the law. But the second part of migrant health services is more discretionary. Um, and so we have certain districts in the state that have applied for migrant health funding that is additional to what they're required to do. And usually it's the districts that have a lot of migrant students and um, have a lot of migrant health issues going on and are willing to go to the extra work of applying for these funds and reporting on these funds. And they have to actually hire people with the funds to go out and do specific things. Um, so some of your districts you're working in have applied for those funds and some of them have not. And so we don't have any clue that they've applied. Is that uh, uh, okay, that's interesting. So s <laughs> some districts may have better, um, yeah, participation in the program once they've applied. Um, okay, and some may think they've applied and haven't. So I thought your ESD 171 
um, flyer that I gave you had the program districts in it, but apparently it does not. So instead I'm going to, um, oh, maybe I can use the document camera. Would it be that easy? Oh, wow. Thank you to the ESD tech department for making that work. Okay. So this is um, a map, and you can see 171 is in blue there. We have a lot of project districts. So the districts you see in blue are the project districts. They're the districts that have applied for those extra migrant health funds that have come with certain requirements that I'll talk about in just a sec. So Tenasket, Okanagan, Brewster, Terrace. Manson, Bridgeport, Lake Chelan, Cascade, Cashmere, East Mount Wenatchee, Arondo, Quincy, Afraid of Oaks. A lot of our districts. So the districts apply for migrant health grant funds? Yes. Those that are in blue have applied. So here's what happens once they've applied to be a project district. They have now a requirement to assign somebody in the district, a records clerk and a recruiter. The records clerk job is to enter the records that are generated from this program into an online system that's uh, web-based and they have a specific logins and they have to track all the students, give them specific numbers, um, and then enter the information the recruiter gives them. Okay, so that's the records clerk. The recruiter, and I'm telling you this because after this talk you may want to go back to your district they're one of these blue districts, find out who those people are, especially the recruiter. Because the recruiter's job is to go out and talk to the family of this migrant student, either at their home or at the school or wherever they can find them, maybe even at the job site. Um, they often do that. And they ask them a specific set of questions recruiters are trained how to um, find out the information they need. And a lot of the questions they ask revolve around health status, health access, and health diagnoses that kids might be coming with, and family situations, and things like that, risk factors. And they get all this information, they bring it back, they go to the records clerk to all they put into the system. Uh, they find out things like insurance, um, whether they have insurance or could get insurance. They're trained to um, know how to help them access the uh, affordable care um, options that might be available to them for the Medicaid. Um, all that information gets put in, and then somebody at the district is um, uh, then required, if they have enough, uh, they're required to attend the training for all of this. Um, somebody at the district is required to work with a health contractor that my department has contracted with, um, and they are listed in your brochure. Somebody in the district is required to work with that contractor and set up a physical event, a health physical event. So you may have heard of these happening in districts where um, Columbia Valley Community Health comes to Cadmere for and they're there for the day and they see like 20 or 40 kids, perhaps, and that's their yearly physical event. And they do, they do these physicals. And they can, this is important to note, they can do sports physicals but the contractor needs to know ahead of time whether they're going to be asked to do a sports physical on certain kids because it takes a little extra time to process the sports physical than it does for the regular medical physical. I don't know why, but I think it does. And so as a courtesy, we do ask that districts ahead of time call out which kids need a sports physical. And that's, you know, that can be really important for a kid to get that sports physical at the same time because if they're, well, you can imagine. So that's key. Um, so those need to happen for kids. It's required by law, by the migrant funding, that migrant kids have access to a physical every three years. Three years. And um, so recruiters, when they go out, will will try to tease out: Have you had a physical, an actual physical? Um, has your child had an actual physical in the last three years? Yeah. Um, yeah, and so for those physicals, do they actually have to come to your campus or can the students go to one of those offices and have their physical done there at their own time? The students can go to the actual office. However, it really needs to happen in order to get well-funded 
easily funded for a family and for them not to run into problems. It really needs to happen through communication between the district and the contractor. And you'll notice in the brochure, I think, that there's actual contact people spelled out for each contractor. So if you just pick up the phone and call the receptionist at Columbia Valley Community Health, for instance, and say, I need to schedule a physical for a student. Oh, and they're migrating. And the receptionist, that's nice, and we'll put you down for an appointment on Wednesday at 10. The billing and the paperwork and the online, the contractor themselves have to go into an online system and note that they've done a physical on migrant student XYZ and that it met the required e physical. We have a specific migrant health physical form they have to fill out for each kid. Um, and then for them to get paid for doing it, it has to be done that way. So you see it, the communication is really important that it happen that way. So you don't want to just counsel a family to call Columbia Valley, for instance, um, because in, unless they have Medicaid, you know, they're covered by insurance, fine, just get their physical done. As, you know, that's fine. But if they don't have insurance, um, and some don't still, you know, the, the reasons for that are, you probably understand them better than I do, that's for sure. Um, but some kids, if they're migrant, you can still pay. And we do pay for their physicals on a weekly basis for paying for migrant student physicals. I see the claims. I just signed one downstairs for several kids who were migrant funded, didn't have, we're the last pair, or the pair of last resort, I guess you'd say. So they didn't have access to Medicaid, they didn't have access to some of their affordable care insurance, so migrant funds paid for their physical. And then I'll also add, as a follow-up to that physical, if, if the physical finds they have a need for dental services or dental checkup, um, we can then send them to a dental contractor, which we actually have several. In, there's dental contractors in every region. Um, and kids can get their dental care paid for um, through migrant funding if they don't have other funding sources and even if there are medically necessary items found on that physical or on that dental checkup, those items, if they're medically necessary, can be paid through our contracts with the contractors. Does that make sense? But it, it needs to happen through that school district contractor. So it doesn't have to happen on campus. It can happen sometimes like we have small districts like say you know, Mattawan is a project district. No, well, let's say uh, Royal City. This actually came up. Royal City had three kids this last year that were migrant, which, first of all, I don't quite believe. But three kids that needed a physical. So maybe they had a very robust physical the last year. But anyway, they said they had three kids that needed a physical, had not had one last three years. And uh, their contract didn't want to count for three kids. If you're in sports, they have to have it every year. But if, oh, they need a sports physical every year. Yeah. Yes. Oh, shoot. Some places too. Maybe they'll waive that. I don't know. Maybe they can't. Oh, yeah, WIH. Oh, yeah, sorry. There was a two. Oh, so I didn't know that. But anyway, yeah, we will do it once every three years at least. So that's something. I'll get you started. Um, yeah. Was there, oh, so um, Royal City actually put the kids on a ban with parent permission. Uh, the recruiter went with the kids and took them to the contractor for their physicals because there was just three of them. They did it. I don't know what timing they did it, but they did it at a good time for the school and the contractor. That's the other thing. The uh, school district needs to work well ahead of time, and I need months in advance, to work with the medical contractor to set up those on campus um, health events. So a lot of times what happens is we get it down in May and a breakfast clerk or recruiter realizes, well, we have 28 kids. They haven't had an, a physical. They need one. I haven't done what I'm supposed to do. We're going to be asked to report. So they call up their contractor partner who says, well, we can't get you in until October. We don't have time to send somebody out. And then they get all kinds of offended. But that's not the way it's supposed to be done. They, they need to give them time. To get there. Right. I have a question. Um, I work at Eastmont, and last year I think they just had people transport to Columbia Valley for physicals. 
but we nurses were totally unaware, and then all of a sudden, last minute, it's like we're supposed to go read TB tests. Yeah, we're in how many different buildings. Yeah. Like, you guys need to let us know ahead of time so we can plan. And then there were, uh, and that's why I'm here today. There were three or four kids from the same family that had positive tests, and um, I got back. I got back this fall, and they're all over me. One of the things, and just reading, mom did not want to fill out the paperwork. I don't know her legal status, and I think she was afraid. Yeah. And so they said, we can't see them unless they do this. And I go, well, this is ridiculous. If you guys yeah. are going to do these and identify them, then you've got to take care of it. I would think so. So we hassled back and forth for a while, and they finally got in, and they're taking the medication they need to take. Was it the health district that was requiring paperwork, like a release, or who was it? I'm sorry, I'm new. Well, and I, you know, I didn't know, but I started making phone calls to people. <laughs> Mike was one of them. Yeah. Um, just to find out, I mean, there must be some money attached to this program, and if the mother refuses to fill out the paperwork, because some of the children weren't born in the United States, the youngest ones were, and they were eligible, um, it was just kind of a, a mess. And there is money um, attached, and certainly, well, the health district should get involved, I believe, if yeah. there's a team. They do. I mean, I talked to them, them and <coughs> talked to Columbia Valley. And I'm sorry, what's your name? My name is Christy Mem. Yeah, um, <laughs> and, and I saw your name, I think, on the paper. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, but at Christy. That is one of the reasons I'm here. So as part of the every health exam, we do the TB test, um, and then they have and and so there's in the scheduling of the health exam when the when the contractors scheduled to come out, they say we won't come out on a on a Friday or Thursday. Or Thursday. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's we won't come out on a Thursday because it's a three day Wednesday to Thursday. I think it is because it's a yeah. Anyway, so they try to schedule that ahead. But this has been a question of mine. Who reads those? I thought is it an expectation that we're supposed to read them? We always well, have. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that was that fall through our district. Those folks who are raised should be sent to nurses and they'll decide what the kids are going in. We need you to look at it. Okay. So that's what happened in our district. I know when when it's scheduled, usually about a month in advance, I get this is the day we're doing physicals. That's physicals. usually a day or two before I get here's the kids we're actually seeing. Yes. And then, yeah. and so then I have, and well, I have the grades in the school, and so perfect. then I know, okay, these so kids I need to go see mm -hmm. two to three days later. So, so I, I think the pre-communication, so that works well. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, the right. pre-communication, it works well, and it's easy to do. Yes. Yes. And I don't like yeah. doing it. You just, just have to do a round at noon on the day So what? So I guess a good take-home message for the staff you're working with is when they have that date set with the contractor, they should also say to the school nurse, this is the date we have set with the contractor for the migrant physicals. We already know what that means. That means in 42 seven, two hours we need to and you need to put it on your calendar. But just knowing that it's so, happening that day. Well, and I'd say back to you, uh, I'm gonna take, I appreciate that. I, that's one of the reasons I'm here is to hear that from you. I also wanna say back to all of you, make sure you connect with whoever's the records clerk and recruiter in your district who is in charge of setting these physical dates and make sure you tell them you gotta let me know if yeah, you want me to do this part for you, you know? yes. yes and so then what i do is i just give her the list back i write my results down and i give it back to her and then she enters it or passes it on to the contractor and they enter it i don't know who actually yeah. enters it. yeah that all that sure. part part of the trouble is um i although i haven't done it yet um, but anyway my department is required to train our school district project district staff and they are required to send someone however when i look back at the uh who came to the last training that mike did it's not all of our project districts so i don't know what's up with the training why you know the training's happening Mike's going out and doing the training, but we have four people show up, not in this region, but in another region. I, I know that all the districts are not getting trained. Well, maybe they've been to 12 of these trainings and they're good. I don't know. I just don't know that. But it's real important they come to the trainings. It used to be, and I don't know if it's still available, um, the database of yes. migrant physicals. You could access, we as um, school districts could access 
their immunization profile there. Um, your gown still? Yeah, I just go through my gown. To say oh, yes. Change. Change. <laughs> so the records clerk now, probably? Yeah. Who's that? There's a very robust... I, I don't I don't think it's probably it worth me showing it to you, but um, I can. And I'll, I'll say about the I can send up the website. And I'm gonna I'm gonna put it back on. But that and and that website when they showed it to me, laptop. Which one is it? Like <laughs> um, when they showed it to me, uh, there's a place where school nurses can look at your district, and it shows red flag kids. After the health exams, if they had anything on there, you can just look at the list of red flag kids and then you can see their names and all the red flags. So, so Winnie, I don't want to take up too much time. No, that's fine. But you do. Okay. What does the green indicate? Look at the flyer again. One's dental, one's medical, and one's bald. Yeah, that's exactly right. No, what happened? They have dental surgery. Oh, okay. Dental surgery. All in one. Okay. So I'm happy to do more later, but I don't want to take up too much time. I think I'm good. Any other questions? I'll send me a second. Yeah, I don't want to cut you guys off, but I also don't want to take up more time than I was given. So. All right, then. I'll send out the information and her contact information, so if you do have any further questions, go ahead and feel free to email us. We have yes. just threw you into the bus like that? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, which one? I don't know. Okay. All right. Well, let's go ahead and wrap up. Um, Diana's um, contact information is right here. I'm also, uh, I also uh, will send it out too, so don't worry about that. Um, her contact information. Okay. Please finish your district assessments. Thank you to all the people who did. And I wasn't going to make you feel bad. <laughs> and I wasn't going to point you off. Um, and if you need any help, let me know. I'll be more than happy to help you. Um, it's great, great data. Um, and we're learning more and more that that is important and it's very useful. And I can help you do the data to get all that together, even though I did promise you one. I never did. Hopefully, they figured it out. Well, you did. You can oh, you. Okay. <laughs> well, I sent you a bunch of stuff, but. Um, okay, and then um, suicide training. Uh -oh. <laughs> Love it. Okay, um, <clears throat> so Youth Mental Health First Aid and the Networks for Life Suicide Training. Well, the Network for Life Suicide Training covers your ESA certification, that part of it, the three hours. But you need six hours for your RN license, and it's only one time that you have to do it. And it has specific criteria that you need in it. Yes, that's my understanding. And so this is the important part. So this is the, this is the important part. And just remember, I want to let you know, this is my perception. <laughs> not my recommendation, not what he said. This is how it is. Okay, but so this is what my understanding is. Before this summer, July 2016, if you get a six hour class done, before that time, it is grandfathered in. So, those two websites I gave you, you need one. I have one that will. Fill the six hour requirement, but will not take you six hours. You just have to read it, answer the questions, and submit it. Okay. I do take donations, though. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I'm not joking. Mental health first aid counts. Mental health first aid counts. No, it doesn't. I, I said that, then I thought about it, and I don't think it's on the list, so sorry. But what the thing is, is you can't add two networks for life. 
to equal the six. Because uh, yeah. I, like, I was like, I should ask that question. I did them like, no. I'm like, oh, come on. Three, three is six. But it's not the same as these different requirements that are needed, which is different from ESA. We told them to talk to each other. Yeah. And so they finally did at the very end. So that's the deal. I'll send it out to you. Just remember, if it comes back and bites us all in the butt because I'm taking it. <laughs> We're not to listen to the front. Okay. <laughs> okay. So are you going to send both options, the full six hours plus yeah. the six hours? There's a list, a DOA list, and a PESB list that are available. That gives you, but it's overwhelming. There's a lot of money. This is like eighteen dollars for this one. This is the other. This is the other. Like, oh, you really do this one? Because it doesn't take you six hours, and it's like eighteen dollars. Is that how we're gonna know? Eighteen dollars for your RN. This is for your RN license. Is there a name for it, and where you? Yes, it's special name, and I don't have it right now because it's in my email. It's in a spot that I have, and I'll give it to you. It's a link. You just do it. Have you sent it once before? Yeah, I think you. No, nope. you have. Oh, I've only sent it to it. select people. It's oh, the magic one. It's <laughs> only to select people who have initiated. Like <laughs> I sent it to Melissa Slate because they had asked me, and I only sent it to. But so now I'm just. To get on your list? It's spring, and I just feel like I'm just going to let it out. <laughs> just because we when stayed the whole day. That's right. Yeah, I didn't know anything about the license here. So, if you remember back. Whenever that was. Yeah, I think it's when I first started because I remember trying to tell you guys how this worked and I was like, I don't even know what they're talking about. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I was like, face. And I'm like, but the law came out about the about school nurses with ESA certifications or okay. were. Um, I, got, I, I think it's if your school district considered you a certificated nurse, so if they were employed as a certificated nurse, you had to do this three-hour training. Y'all had to and get we did it. We did it. Did it. We just yeah, we did right, it. which you're good. Because your ESA lasts for like seven years. Oh, it's a five now. It's seven, and then you can the just redo one. your initial ESA. You don't have to do the continued one. You can do it again for another seven years. Forever oh. until it changes. Until ever, until you retire. Oh. Then you can go in the world too. Anyway, and then, but then your art license is just like, that started, I have the law somewhere, but I can't remember when that all came into play, but I know Debbie Carlton came, and we're like, you gotta talk to the art license and make sure you guys are all talking together because this is craziness. So, anyway, that's, Kind of the simplest way I can, I'll put some language in um, in there when I email you guys out stuff. Um, but that's the deal with the suicide training. And so, you know, what, after that, this summer, then you have to have like, vet, there has to be a veteran piece in it, and there's these other different pieces of this. But you don't, have to, once you get it grandfathered in, you're good. Because well, I remember about three years ago here taking all day suicide prevention class. Is it conceivable that that would qualify for a You can, I have a contact person, you can email them and ask them. And I'll send it to you. I'll send you that contact person too. So if you have any other further questions, you can ask them. Um, next, next, class, next workshop is May 4th, which is the school nurse day, which I don't think it's really that day. I think it's the next Wednesday, but whatever. I can't remember <laughs> my brain. I tell me I'm um, What I think about doing is doing something different and just do the school nurse core people, the people we fund, just like an hour and a half in the morning. And if you all want to come, we'll, you can come and we'll have some education. I'm not sure what yet. Public health, of course, and then we'll have lunch, which will be free, which will be great, and then we'll go do the OFPI K twenty field children's thing. So, and then we'll 
$300 budget okay and we haven't spent it so is there something you know last year I got those the I snow got those uh, coffee cards is there something different yeah that I mean there's a speaker you would like to bring in for that or I'll see you want to provide the lunch is. or well, I was gonna have the um, insurance people are just they're like I'm lining up. We, I mean yeah. they're just like vultures they just want to come in I was okay. just gonna ask that all right but let me, why don't you, let's all think about what we can spend it on. Um, what can we do? Um, I know that one of the... Calculus is wine. That diabetes educator nurse from Children's really wanted to come. Oh, okay. That would be a good idea. That was interesting. Now, is there going to be a diabetic component to this K-20 on the, on the floor? Oh, yeah. And they're actually going to try to bring somebody here that has a bunch of devices that you can play with and goof off mm -hmm. oh. around with and stuff and kind of check she things out. Be part of that. She oh, might be part of that, that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's a great idea. Um, that's a good question. I don't know. Anybody have any ideas out there? Do you get this every day? Think year? about it. Yeah, you can email, email me. you. Yeah. I think I should speak to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's it's hard to think of. What about? But I think they might do it for free if we have a school here. Especially the school birthday, they might just. Oh, okay. I just love that. Is there a massage school? They even do get a prescription for massage therapy. It's a good one about that program. I do one once a month and I love it. Yes, me too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. They have to do some yeah. so yeah. Our clinic insurance stuff. Yes. So okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. So anybody who teaches um, sex education or HIV AIDS, this is a brand new website and it was under that medically accurate scientific whatever the phrase is they always do. This is from OSBI. It's in that sexual health standards thing. This has been my favorite tool. I don't know if you guys teach it. I teach HIV, AIDS, sex ed every year, and it's never been a very comfortable topic. I'm pretty, you know, <laughs> private. I was kind of like raised really conservative, so it's been this really big growing stretch to teach this stuff. But honestly, um, I've gotten more and more comfortable with it, and this to me is the very best tool I've used in five years. I'm really excited about it, and I have been using it this week to teach kids, and mostly from freshmen and up but the fantastic thing is you don't have to have the product in front of you it's just bam right there kids that are really embarrassed to ask personal questions can go on here it's so user-friendly even I can do it without anybody teaching me all right so here we go this is so awesome this is what they recommend so you don't have to know everything about it as a nurse you just go to this little bugger right there and they like oh this is an IUD well then you can tell them that's what that looks like and then the info highlights on whatever you touch. It's fantastic. Or I love this one, look, the lock, not right now. <laughs> so this is abstinence, right? So then it goes on to every detail about that. You can um, fertility awareness, you can learn about anything. Um, withdrawal, why? <laughs> That this is interesting. That one doesn't work very well when you're talking to kids, but a lot of people don't know what a vaginal um, condom, or we didn't, you know, we're kind of, this is like new product we've never seen before. A lot of people that have been in a monogamous or long-term marriage, we haven't dealt with this stuff for a long time. Um, the patch, here's the most effective list, which I love that it's there under categories, it's highlighted. There's your top four. Are you gonna tie off your tubes? No, not in, you know, for our group, but then here's the top three, and it really helps. They really reacted positively to this. Party ready. Party ready. <laughs> I, you know, I'm gonna use this when I'm teaching my seniors. I teach them separate because when they go to college, we get pretty specific about, you know, I'm not stupid. A lot of you are gonna be sexually active. What I want you to do is protect your body. And I don't know, I mean, who knows what it's correlated to, but we had um, a lot of pregnancies <clears throat> for a small school. And I don't know if maybe this committed education that we've been doing for five years with the nurse there, with them having access to me, 
um, we haven't had a pregnancy knock on whatever's around me for four years. And I think that, I think it matters. I don't know. I mean, how, you know, can we prove it? I don't know. Well, how can it not help? I've had five or six kids. I'll tell you, every time I teach this class, there's one kid at least every time that comes to me that, oh, her condom broke. I think I have an STD. Where do I go? Can I have a condom? All that stuff. I taught eighth grade condom use this year. It's the first time it's been in the no curriculum. And I was like, ooh, I wonder how this is going to go over. I was a little hesitant about it. Five boys came to me afterwards and said, can I have a condom, Mrs. Riley? Because you're right. I'm too embarrassed to get it at the store because everybody knows us and that kind of thing. And, and two guys said, I just want it, so I'm prepared. Thank you for telling me. And I was like, thank you. I mean, this it made it all worthwhile. So wait, this is so cool. Watch this. Um, you can do, wait, uh, um, back to birth control. You can compare methods um, if you want to just do that. So I'm actually gonna sit down, my daughter will kill me, but we're doing this today uh, because I, I want, she's going to college and I'm like, this is the best website ever and she's, you know, I'm just gonna talk to her about it today because we're home alone as Gus girls. Look at this graph, it's girls night. We're gonna talk about this stuff because I want her to be able to highlight on it and it goes through everything about effectiveness, side effects, STI. So here's, this is great because a lot of people have this myth that if I'm on birth control, I'm protected. You know, and this is like a graph. Oh crap, I'm not. I mean, it, it doesn't take a lot of reading to see the red X. <laughs> oh, it doesn't cover that. Um, anyway, it's awesome. And uh, you can do build your own. If you have top three and you wanna compare, you just put in which method and you've got a side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, it's just wonderful. And then down here, if you've got the kind of uh, person who can't remember anything, this, you know, this technology age is so awesome because right on the bottom, look, text my BC, my birth control, to this number and they will remind you to, to take your pill or put in whatever or, you know, change the patch. Honestly, I think some people will like this. There's appointment reminders two days before for your birth, you know, I don't know, it's kind of cool. But my favorite part is under the features Here's real stories, and there's tons of men that talk about um, those guys and girls. I also personally like that they're not using 14, 15 year old people for their stories when they're talking about sex. I haven't seen one yet. I haven't been through the whole website, but um, you know, like when they talk about this stuff, there's all these different ages, and they, you know, it's every race, every age, every type of like I'm abstinent, I'm not, and it's under every topic. So it's really cool. And then when you want something really lighthearted, at the end, there's those two, where, where we are, uh, features. Fact or fiction. Um, so there's a lot of, oops. Oh, I haven't done this page, sorry. <laughs> features, I thought it was under features. Yeah, um, guy's guide to birth control, real stories, that's what it is. And it has these cute little videos that are, um, what happened? Not those. Sorry, guys. You can tell I'm still new to this. What the heck? Real story, guys. Got to find, uh, sorry. It's on the bottom, I thought. Frisky Fridays? That sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> fact or fiction? Oh, I think it's fact or fiction. Yeah. These are great. Watch, watch the, oh, crap. This mouse is really quick. Sorry, okay, so this is like the topic, and these are on Pinterest too. So this is like if you haven't, you're not sure if you need to use uh, birth control every time. And that's what I had someone come talk to me. They use a condom every time, but not last night. And I'm like, oh, perfect. <laughs> Here we go. I have a friend that doesn't even bother using birth control anymore. <laughs> She figures if she hasn't gotten pregnant, isn't it yet, great? She probably never will. <laughs> That's kind of like believing you can fly just because you've never fallen off the side of a building. <laughs> she and her boyfriend keep at it without detection. There's actually an 85% chance she will get pregnant within a year. I love that
Isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's everything from waiting to like, you know, it, it's got a lot of cool topics. So you can pick what's, you know, appropriate for your age group and stuff like that. But it fits for, you know, our families and our kids and all that stuff too. So anyway, I loved it. I thought it was a good site. So just a, a fun tool. Oh, and it's on Spanish too. So you can print Spanish flyers off and all that stuff. I had to go to the CDC before, but not even on CDC, a lot of stuff's not in Spanish. So the whole thing's in Spanish on the bottom. Um, on the main center part, it says that. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Duh, thanks. Top right. And it all converts. It's awesome. I mean, how many websites do that? I was so excited because we, you know, more and more, that's... Did you discover how this um, no, it's just under that new resources. And I was looking for stuff because the no curriculum is totally outdated from 2007 for high school. It's embarrassing to teach it. And then they're like, oh, don't teach that. Well, if you don't have a curriculum, what do you do, right? So every year I invent my curriculum. So, um, but so it was really helpful to use this one. But anyway, it's super cool. I thought I really, I thought you might enjoy it as a tool. And it's a quick go-to when you don't know the answer, you know? Yeah. So anyway, the kids really liked it. Yeah, you're welcome. Good. All right, thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments or? Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all your work. Good. Oh, nothing compared to what you all do every day. Okay. Okay. Can I catch a ride with someone? Yeah. Okay. All right.